Hey guys, welcome to Amity Tracks. Today we're going to look at Jackson Brown. We're going to rank his records, kind of go through, talk about him a bit, talk about him as an artist. You know, what one of the great singer-songwriters, you know, one of the few that sort of set the whole template for what a, you know, the singer-songwriter of the 70s and beyond should be and really one of the one at his best, one of the best. Now he wasn't, in my view, as you'll see, not always at his best. But when when he's on, um, it's hard to beat. So we're we're, we're going to talk about um, you know his his records and uh, kind of go through and, and see what we like. Uh, there are fifteen records, but this isn't going to be too long because I'd say, you know, the bottom third, I'm going to be, cause I kind of have the same complaints about you know, the bottom third of his discography. So I'm not going to belabor those <clears throat> and we'll get to the better stuff. I am, now, you know, usually when we rank records, you know, we're, we're ranking studio albums. I am including running on empty, which is, you know, technically uh, at least partially live record. But I include it because it's it's all new material, you know. So it's not like a live record of him playing, you know, his older songs. He's presenting new songs just in this particular format, and you know, occasionally artists will do that. Neil Young did that, you know, with uh, uh, um, "Time Fades Away." <laughs> Sorry. Um, so in those cases, I usually include that record because the purpose is the same as a studio record. So with that said, there's 15. When we finish going through them, I'll talk a little bit about a couple of live records and, and a great compilation. Stay tuned for that because this might be a hot take, but there are two live records from the early 2000s that I think are the best records he ever put out, even better than you know the 70s peaks. So we'll, we'll get to that, but that's at the end. All right. So, like I said, we're, we're going to go through these bottom ones pretty quick. These bottom ones I, I have on CD. I, I mean, I haven't bothered to try and hunt them down on vinyl. It's just not worth it, honestly, to me. But don't worry. We'll get to the vinyl. That's kind of you know, the top part of the list. But we got to kind of run through these bottom ones first. So at number 15 from 2002, I have The Naked Ride Home. I don't know what to say about this record. Yeah, that's the problem with some of these near the bottom. I, I, I find them so anonymous, um, like musically, first of all. He, he used to be, you know, in the 70s, he had this great kind of singer-songwriter sound. I think when the 80s dawned, there's a few records there where I think he really successfully made the transition and kind of incorporating some of the new wave that was going on at the time. But starting in the mid to late 80s, uh, you know, kind of mid late 80s, he, pretty bad taste in synthesizers and all of that. And then in the 90s and on, with a few exceptions, there's kind of this anonymous sort of adult contemporary, well, adult contemporary, but AOR, you know, um, very good, competent session musicians, but it just sounds so anonymous. And, uh, I, I found with these bottom ones in this ranking after listening to them, you know, two minutes later, I couldn't remember a song or, you know, nothing really stuck. You know, and that, that's, unfortunately that's the way he, he's, he's always kind of kept real good lyric writing. And he's one of the great lyricists, I think, but musically it's just, yeah. Uh, there's the night inside me is pretty good. It's the only thing that I, I, I could recommend on this one. So let's kind of keep going in that vein. Get through these. 2008, Time the Conqueror. Um, yeah, there's not a single song on here that sticks out to me. So everything I just said on that one, rinse, repeat. Okay. Yeah, it was going quick. Um, <laughs> so... Next, number 13, is his most recent one. 
downhill from everywhere. That's the only one I don't have a physical copy of, so editor can throw that up here, downhill from everywhere. I, actually, I didn't write down. I, a few years ago, I forgot the exact year. He can throw that up there, too. That's what's great thing about having an editor. Downhill from everywhere. Um, you know what's interesting? Even on these ones that I find kind of dull, one distinct thing about Jackson Brown, even into more you know recent decade or the latest decade of his music, he has really kept his his voice really intact. A part of that is I think his singing style. You know, he, he a really nice, smooth voice, but never really strained all that much. You know, I mean, you know, so he's not one of these artists who, you know has this screeching, screaming stuff in his youth, and then he's got to try and reproduce that in, in a, you know, when he's old. <coughs> you know, his um, his singing style, I think, lent itself to aging gracefully. Let's put it that way. He's got a great voice, great voice. Why am I saying that? Because finally on his most recent record, I, I'm seeing or hearing the ravages of age. Uh, this is the first record where I, I find his voice kind of weaker and, and, and it's not bad. It's just, you, know, you can just tell he's older, you know, and, and, and this, but this is the first record where I kind of noticed. Him. So, uh, other than that, um, I don't have much to say on it. It's again, same complaints as the earlier ones. Yeah. This one too. Don't worry. There's one recent record of his that I really like. So it's, yeah, I'm not bashing everything that he's done recently, but kind of. Let's, let's at least go back to the 90s, shall we? My number 12 is Looking East. So Looking East from 1996. Yeah, Barricades of Heaven is a tremendous song. God, that song is so good. Unfortunately, like the rest of this doesn't come close to living up to that song. I mean, you'll find that on some of these, these kind of you know, albums that rank kind of lower on the list, he'll knock one or two out that are just great, but it's just doing a whole record of it. For me, it's not happening at this bottom part of the list. All right, number 11. Let's go to the 80s. With, oh, here's, here's some vinyl. 1986, is it? Yeah, 86. Lives in the Balance. So this is where I think this is his first record where he really gets political. That's another complaint. I, you know, I don't mind political songs, even if it doesn't line up with my own personal beliefs. That's fine. Um, I will say it's hard to do good political songs, to do it convincingly. Creedence Clearwater Revival, Fortunate Son is an example of one. It's timeless. Uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, really Neil Young's Ohio. It's timeless. Those were like Ohio's a visceral reaction to something that had just happened, and that's, that kind of captures that. Fortunate Son, I think, is remarkable because it's it's so universal through the decades. It's hard, man. And so a lot of times, you know, this is what like what I say, '86. Yeah, maybe some real relevant stuff in '86, but it immediately dates it when jackson brown gets political it gets a little too preachy to me and a little too obvious and the guy's such a great songwriter like lyrically so when he sticks to the personal i think he's unbeatable as as, as a songwriter um really or you know one of the greats but when he kind of gets political it's it just sucks it i don't know in the Shape of a Heart's a pretty good tune, I think. But, yeah, I'm not a big fan of Lives in the Balance. Um, so, in that same vein, the one that came after that is World in Motion and the same thing. It's very political. Again, I don't think it's very effective in that, in that vein. Um, there are two really good songs on here, and what do you know? They're the two songs where he gets more into the personal versus the political. Enough of the Night, great song. Chasing You Into the Night, Into the Light, it's another good song. The rest of it, I, I, I don't, yeah. And on top of that, this is 89. Um, you know, the, 
this and the and lives in the balance have some pretty bad 80s synthesizers i like 80s some 80s synths but it can be done poorly and i think it's done here believe me i really do like jackson brown we're get, we're gonna get to the stuff where i'm gonna be singing his praises but we got to get through this to me kind of the lower third uh number nine is 1993's I'm Alive. And, you know, I, he, he kind of gets back into the personal here, and, and it suits him. You know, Too Many Angels is great. Uh, Sky Blue and Black is really good. Um, yeah. yeah I, he kind of mixes some political in here, too. But, but yeah, this is we're, we're getting better. We're getting better. Uh, number, let's see, where are we at? Yeah, I bet you thought I was saving all the 70s for the top. Well, no, because right here, where am I? At number eight, I do have his debut, Jackson Brown. Now, it says Saturate Before Using, and some people think that's what the album title is. It's not called Saturate Before Using. It's just called Jackson Brown. Yeah, so this is his debut from 1972. and so, you know, Jackson Brown had already kind of made a name for himself uh, as a songwriter. He was already very well respected. You know, it, I, I should have mentioned from the beginning, he kind of comes out of that Southern California, you know, kind of L.A. Uh, songwriting circles. Um, you know, like with, you know, the Eagles and, and Linda Ronstadt and kind of that, that whole area there. But, uh, you know, he was already very well respected as, and well known as a songwriter even before his, uh, his debut. You know, he, he dated um, uh, Nico, you know, who has been with the Velvet Underground and, and all that. And uh, Chelsea Girl, real good record of hers. He wrote several songs uh, that are on there. But, yeah, you know, so he's already kind of respected as a songwriter, uh, you know, by the time he finally got a chance to you know, put his own music out. So it's clear from the get-go that we're dealing with a serious, like, really good songwriter here. Now, he, he's going to get better. You know, th this is his debut. He's going to get better. But there are a few real knockout songs, and they're the, they're the ones that are familiar. Uh, Doctor My Eyes, great song. That, that, that one has a great groove and rock, kind of rocks. Rock Me on the Water, great song, too. Jamaica Say You Will is on there. That, that, was, that was covered by several people. Um, yeah, so anyway, let's real good, real good, but he's going to get better. <laughs> so, all right, where are we at now? Number seven, we're finally into the area where, well, I would include, uh, his debut too, where I think these are really good to great records from here. So yeah, I, I do like Jackson Brown, I promise. I feel like I've been bashing them too much. At number seven, I have 1980s Hold Out. Hold Out. Hold Out. Hold Out. Hold Out. I don't know why. I don't know why I'm stressing it differently. Okay. Hold Out. Now, this one, I think, is a really interesting record. So 1980, the dawn of the 80s. I got to hand it to him. You know, there, there are some people who don't really like this record that much. I actually do. I think at least half of it is great. I think this and then the one that came after this, he really does make the transition for a little while into kind of some sort of new wave sounds or sort of punchy kind of rock songs really well. Um, there, there are two just knockout songs on here for me. That Girl Could Sing which was kind of a minor hit. Yeah, in fact, you, know, you get on some of his greatest hits records, it's not on there, but it was sort of a minor single. I think, God, that's a fantastic song. It's got that great, great kind of percussive piano riff on there. And it's just, it's a great, great song. And Boulevard, I think Boulevard rocks. That great kind of gritty guitar, which you don't get all the time with Jackson Brown. Yeah. I don't know, hold on, hold out. He, you know, from, from the 70s and into this time, a lot of times he would kind of put these sort of epic closers, you know, kind of longer songs, you know, the big statement. I think that one's all right. Because, so there's a, the title track, which is Hold Out, 
And then on the other side of the record, there's Hold On, Hold Out. So anyway. I think this is kind of an underrated record. I, I, I really like this one. All right. Number. Now, so here's what I was saying. On number six, I do have a recent record. This one really surprised me. I think it's really, really good. This is 2014. So <clears throat> this is the, you know, he's had that one since then, but the one right before that. So very recent. Uh, Standing in the Breach, I think is, is, a, is, a, is a winner. This is really good. And it's interesting. He he starts to um, to kind of get into you know some of those sort of epic length songs. I mean, not epic, you know, it's not like twenty minutes or anything, but you know, seven eight minutes where there's kind of some longer instrumental passages, sort of like he used to in some you know at some points. And I think it's really effective. Uh, the long way around, leaving Winslow is great. Kind of kind of country feel to it. It opens with this song, The Birds of St. Mark's, which is kind of a notorious song of his that he had been working on since, I think, the late 60s. And it was always sort of unfinished. And then he kind of played around with it live a lot, where he did play it in concerts, but never put it on an album until here. So that's kind of cool. But uh, this is a real sleeper. See, you know, I, again, I was bashing all of his recent stuff. This is the one that stands out. I guess for me, for the past 30 years of his work, from the 90s on, this is the best one. I think this is really good. 2014, Standing in the Breach. Okay, what do we got now? Number five. This had to come up at some point. <laughs> Running on Empty. Was it 77? Yeah. <clears throat> 1977. Very interesting concept album really it's, it's it's a concept album about the road life on the road you know um you know it's a lot of hotel rooms and drugs and you know town to town and um here's the thing with running on it this, i think this is his most successful record this is a huge huge seller uh mainly on the strength of the hits right um the loadout combined with the cover of Stay. You heard, for a long time, you heard that on classic rock radio a lot. Loadout's kind of cool, sort of this, this tribute to the roadies, you know, the work that they do, you know, the, after the shows and all that. But of course, it's the title track, <laughs> Running on Empty. So, And here's my problem with this record. I really like it in concept. It's a cool idea. Like these songs kind of thematically connected about you know, sort of life on the road. And I like that some of them were recorded live. Some of these songs were recorded at sound checks. Some of these songs were recorded like in, in hotel rooms. Um, about half of them are covers, actually. But, uh, you know, so, so I, I really like that whole idea. The problem is I don't think it's really strong all the way through. And the title track which is the opening track, Running on Empty, is so tremendous. I think that's one of the best songs of the 70s. It, it, just, it, it, it just encapsulates by the late 70s this sort of weariness, but it's also a great rocking song. I mean, you put it on and hit the road, right? It's a great road trip song. That song is so tremendous that I, I think the rest of the record doesn't, it's hard to, hard to do, but doesn't like, live up to the to that song doesn't get to that level and so it's kind of like you it opens with that and you're like man this is awesome and that's the best song on the on the record like easily i'm not saying this stuff is bad i'm it's more that like that song is so good <laughs> that it kind of overshadows i don't know if you kind of see what i'm saying overshadows the rest of the record but again i really i admire it as a record and a concept i think that's kind of cool all right well, here we are. Um, number four, well, actually, number four is, is kind of a surprise. I don't know, surprise. Maybe surprise that it's this high. I don't know how many how how many people really like this record a lot. I I really I think it's grow. Obviously, number three. I really like it. Um, Nineteen eighty three, right? Yeah, 
83, uh, Lawyers in Love. You know, what he started with Holdout, uh, I think he does even better here, sort, sort of uh, uh, you know, connecting to that kind of newer, you know, new wave, new wavy sounds. There are, again, you can always kind of pick these out on some of these records. There are two tremendous tracks on here. The title track, Lawyers in Love, which is great. You know, was it last night I was I watched watched the news from Washington, the Capitol, and was it the Russians got away as Russians as Russians do? You know, I, anyway, it was. Uh, I love that line. I'm butchering the line, but you probably remember what I'm saying. Yeah, Lawyers in Love is such a great song, and then Tender is the Night. I think is just great. It's like early '80s pop single. So good. God, that's a great song. And, and honestly, a lot of the rest, not every song, but a lot of the rest of this record, I think, is really good. That four rocker is kind of cheesy, but um, I like a lot of the, these other songs too. I, like I said, I think he really makes that transition well into, into, into the early 80s. All right, top three. No surprise here. After the debut, he has three records upon which his reputation really was built. I mean, I, I guess you know, Running on Empty was a huge seller, but this is where he kind of got his critical cachet with these three records. It's just a matter of what order to put them in, right? His second, third, and fourth records into the mid-70s. Uh, they all kind of, I, I can just kind of, we can go quickly through them because I can kind of say the same thing because I think all three of them sound very similar. Um, you know, a lot of acoustic guitar. Great. I should have mentioned this earlier. David Lindley, right? Uh, great guitar player. You know, Jackson Brown's, you know, partner in, in music. You know, a lot of this stuff. David Lindley is hugely important for the sound of these records. I should put that out there. But yeah, a lot of piano, a lot of acoustic guitars. A lot of singer-songwriter stuff. A lot of these songs in the five to seven minutes length. Brilliant lyrics. And, and again, very personal uh, subject matters. A lot of kind of relationship songs. But in a very complex manner. Uh, uh, just, I think, one of the great singer-songwriters on these three records. So, uh, you, can say, you can say that about all three of these records. Uh, number three, I go with, uh, was it 73? Yeah, no, it's 76, 1976, The Pretender. Um, yeah, it's great. I mean, your bright baby blues. Um, that daddy's tune is great. No, I mean, this, this whole thing is great. The pretend, the title track, kind of the big song. I've always had kind of an issue, and I'm trying to, this, this tag is really bothering me. Sorry. I've always had kind of a big issue with, um, not a big issue, but that song, The Pretender. I, maybe, I, maybe I'm misreading it lyrically, but it always came across as kind of real condescending. It's like, you know, he's very critical, you know, of, of, and maybe he's talking about how society pushes us into this sort of, you know, banal, uh, you know, go to work nine to five and, suburban, whatever. But it, I don't know. When I listen to it, it sounds like he's, he's kind of very critical of it. And it, it's like, well, you know, what else can a lot of people do? Not everyone can be a great singer, songwriter, musician like you, Jackson Brown. So a lot of people, a lot of us do have to go to a nine to five job. And, you know, I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm off the mark on that. But so there's that. But I, I mean, great, great record. Great record. But for me, I love these these top two they're close but my number two is 73's for every man his second record opens with take it easy yeah the eagles song right I, I, a lot of people don't know that that jackson brown co-wrote that song and put it on his own record of course it's the eagles version that is huge that everyone knows but jackson brown's take it easy is really good too uh, it's a fantastic song um, yeah, and in fact, it was mostly written by Jackson Brown and, and, 
uh, if I remember the story, you know, Glenn Fry kind of provided one or two crucial lines because Jackson Brown was kind of sort of stuck. He, he was writing this great song, but he kind of had writer's block. And Glenn Fry, um, I think the uh, there's a girl, my lord, and flatbed forward, slowing down to take a look at me. I think that's Glenn Fry's line that sort of got Jackson Brown's writing writer's block unstuck. But Brown wrote the bulk of that song, and but then co-credited Glenn Fry on it. And of course, it was a great Eagles hit. But I like Jackson Brown's version too. Yeah, these days, ah, oh, that, that is ah, oh, the beautiful. Acoustic guitar line. That is a gorgeous song. Redneck Friend is fun. For Every Man. It's a great song. And I like how Take It Easy kind of flows into Our Lady of the Well. And then at the end, Sing My Songs to Me flows into For Every Man. It's kind of a nice you know, sort of bookend thing there. Yeah, this, this is singer-songwriter stuff of the highest order. But even slightly higher is my number one pick which is 1974's Late for the Sky. This, this quite simply is one of the great records of the 70s. It is one of the great sort of singer-songwriter, you know, and I, I put this really above anything from James, James Taylor. Or, you know, I, I don't know. I think this is one of the great singer-songwriter albums. Fountain of Sorrow might be his greatest song. I mean, just read the lyrics to that song. It's so good. I mean, that, that whole verse where he just talks about this photograph that he finds of his girlfriend or whatever, uh, you know, taken long ago and where he kind of caught her off guard. And, and the whole, whole verse, he, he you know, talks about what that photo captures. It's just brilliant songwriting. Um, yeah, Late for the Sky is a great song for a dancer before the deluge, Del deluge, whatever. Oh, I can't pronounce things. But yeah, start to finish. This is one of the great singer-songwriter albums. A must. A must. All right, real quick here, guys. Kind of wrap it up. Um, there's several really good uh, compilations out there. Um, what, what's it called? The, the Next Voice You Hear, The Best of Jackson Brown. It's a single disc. It's, to me, that, that doesn't capture everything. This, this is just called The Very Best of Jackson Brown. It's a double disc. Look how big that is. There's 16 tracks on each side. So you're talking about 32 tracks. Really hits the mark. The whole first disc is mostly that 70s singer-songwriter stuff. So it really picks real important songs off of, uh, um, you know, all those you know, 70s records. Uh, and then, you know, getting in disc two starts with Running on Empty and then kind of goes through. I don't know, into the, I guess into the 90s, whenever this came. This came out 2004, so into the early 2000s. And, and does, does you the favor of cherry-picking some of those good songs from, like, some of those 90s records. Um, yeah, this, if you want a one-stop, this is, this is it. I mean, I, I get that. Now, real quick, I, I know we've been going for a little while, but let me tell you my favorite Jackson Brown records, even more than uh, Late for the Sky. He did these solo acoustic shows uh, in the mid-2000s and released Jackson Brown Solo Acoustic Volume 1 and Jackson Brown Solo Acoustic Volume 2. I bought them separately. I've seen them packaged together in one set. You know, either way, whatever. Both are essential. The you know Volume 1 has more of his older stuff, but some newer stuff. Here's the thing, though. Volume 2 really focuses mostly on newer material, at least from the time, at the time. And stripping away just kind of that bland session band, you know, sound where he's just on us. For one, these are kind of a revelation. That Jackson Brown's a really good acoustic guitar player. I mean, finger picking, and, and, and he's an engaging performer. And... It's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, storytellers or something, you know, or unplugged. He he kind of tells stories in between the songs, and they're really fun. He's real witty, and 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 also, I I love that these CDs. I don't know why other you know, things like this, you know, where there's talking in between songs, 
they uh, this is like a pet peeve of mine and i love that they do this here they separate out the the intro and talking in between songs as separate tracks so if you want to just get to the songs you can and you know maybe if you listen to it over and over again you don't want to hear the story you know 50 times so you just want to get to the songs allows you to do that because it separates out the tracks it's just a little thing here but he is an incredible voice great guitar player that was a revelation to me um and just like a songwriter extraordinaire singer songwriter extraordinaire i can't recommend these enough i, I mean i'm seriously like listening to these is what made me really appreciate jackson brown's music and then go back so i mean five stars <laughs> that's how much i recommend these and then late for the sky is a five star record and for every man, I put a four-star record, and you know those are the the essential ones. I mean, you know, honestly, if you want to get these two, and get this, maybe grab late for the sky because you just have the whole thing. That's a great Jackson Brown collection. Anyway, that's my Jackson Brown. What do you guys think? So you know, in the comments, let's talk Jackson Brown. You have a different ranking thoughts on Jackson Brown's music? Let's talk Jackson Brown. Please do subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications, like the videos, all that stuff, and we'll see you next time.